Hello again. When I began to study this lesson, I realized that I had taught on a very similar theme in one of our lessons in Colossians. I had to laugh and wonder if God is trying to get this message of submission a little more firmly in my mind. Dario and I have a wonderful marriage and we've been married for almost 55 years. And I have to admit that we have both had to learn to give and take and love and respect in new ways as time has gone by. But studying God's word together has blessed us both and been a guide in our lives for many years. We know that our love should reflect the love of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, as we go over this study together, help us to hear you clearly and take the steps to put your love into practice in all our relationships. Amen. At the end of chapter two of our study, we are told by Peter, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. To honor our shepherd, we are called to follow the example he set in being submissive to the Father. He is Lord and leader of our lives, and Peter is directing us to follow the way of the overseer of our souls by addressing our approach to the relationships in our lives. So in verses 1 to 7, he talks about relationship and marriage. Much like the advice we heard in James and Ephesians, Peter is talking again about a respectful, harmonious relationship where a woman honors the leadership of her husband and the husband is understanding and honoring his wife. He talks to wives first. These seem to be wives whose husbands have not found the way of the Lord. His hope is that through healthy submission and a humble attitude, a wife's manner and behavior would win her husband to the Lord. It seems to me that he is encouraging her to be, by example, a true follower of Christ Jesus in her spirit, so that she would be a reflection of the love of the Lord to her husband. We should all reflect the love of the Lord in our relationships. The spirit he's looking for he describes as gentle and quiet, not loud and argumentative, or complaining or whining or nagging. He is asking that she relies on the Lord for the love and strength she needs each day to live as a strong, obedient, loving Christian woman. Peter also talks about the unnecessary need to impress by outward appearance. Now, as women, we're all different. Some of us express our personalities by wearing bright clothes and colorful jewelry. Others prefer subtler tones and more classic jewelry or no jewelry. Peter's not telling us how to dress, but telling us to pay attention to our inner spirit and be the person we are without trying to draw attention to ourselves or impress others by outward expression only. We should all reflect the love of the Lord inside and out. Again, as we've talked about before, Willing submission is at the heart of all godly relationships. To be submissive to another's authority means to cooperate voluntarily out of love and respect for God and that person. Jesus submitted to death so that, he could be, so that we could be saved. Preaching, nagging, or subtle manipulation doesn't work. Warren Wiersbe talks of a zealous wife who used to keep religious radio programs on all evening, usually very loud, so that her unsaved husband would hear the truth. <laughs> she only made it easier for him to leave home and spend his evenings with his friends. Our CBS commentary tells us that first century wives were under the absolute authority of their husbands. If he converted, he brought his wife along. But if she became a believer and he wasn't, her faith would become a divisive element. Peter's remedy is that the wife win her husband over by her respectful and pure conduct, win him over with Christ's example of love and submission. 
In verse 7, he addresses husbands and how they should live in the marriage. They are to honor their wives, know them, and understand them. This was a radical teaching at this time and in the surrounding culture. Women didn't have many rights. As head of the household, the husband was an in charge. But Peter was teaching this new idea that even though women were regarded as physically weaker than men, they were still equals with men in this new life of God's grace, even in marriage. There is no distinction between men and women in receiving the inheritance of salvation. Peter is really challenging the cultural assumptions of the time, as both James and Paul did in their teachings, all learned from their source, Jesus. The love we learn from the example of Jesus Christ is what should guide the behavior of every Christian in every relationship. We don't persuade by arguing or demeaning or being preachy. We win people to Christ by loving them, respecting them, listening to them, serving them, giving them truth in love when they can hear it, and standing by them in love. We should all reflect the love of the Lord in our relationships. Peter moves on to speak to the whole Christian community when he says in verse 8, Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. In other words, reflect the love of the Lord in your relationships. In calling for like-mindedness or unity, he doesn't mean uniformity. Unity means cooperation in the midst of diversity. Christians, as members of the body of Christ, must work together in unity, even though they're not, at all, they're not all the same. We must have the same goals, but not necessarily the same methods. And they must be able to cooperate and respect each other to achieve those goals. So in our physical bodies, every cell is different but each has a role to play. Every cell has the same DNA code, the master plan for the whole body. Every cell of our bodies has the same mind. Or like in a choir. I've sung in choirs my whole life, and I know that in a good choir, each one sings with his own voice, and some sing different parts. But everyone sings to the same music, and in harmony, and for the same purpose, to make beautiful music together. We are told to have sympathy for one another or compassion, to be tender-hearted, to love one another. This was the measure Jesus gave the world to identify his true disciples. From John 13, 35, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The opposite of loving would be revenge, or as Peter states it, repaying evil for evil, or reviling for reviling. Warren Wiersbe says that as Christians, we can live on one of three levels. We can return evil for good, which is the satanic level. We can return good for good and evil for evil, which is the human level. Or we can return good for evil, which is the divine level level. We are called to the divine level of returning good for evil. And he asks us to go further so that our good would include a blessing. We will be blessed as we take the time to bless others. We've talked so much about our call to action as Christians. We must be merciful to others as God is merciful to us. We should reflect the love of the Lord in all our relationships. To help make this point, Peter quotes from Psalm 34, verses 12 to 16. Verse 10 quotes, Whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Wouldn't we all want that? To love life and see good days? It sounds like the ideal. And yet, according to the rest of the verse, we have work to do to make it happen. We've talked in recent lessons about how hurtful our words can be. 
The old adage that words can never hurt me is a lie from the depths of the bottomless pit. Words can cut like swords, hurting to the deepest part of a soul. I read somewhere uh, or saw somewhere where there was a plaque hanging on a wall that read, Lord, keep your arm around my shoulder and your hand over my mouth. We are to be truth speakers, not exaggerators or liars or those spreading rumors or half-truths. We are to speak words that are true and uplifting and fulfilling of, and full of brotherly love and humility. We should pray for hearts and tongues that reflect the love of the Lord. And in reflecting that love, we are called to do good, to seek peace and pursue it. Put our faith into action. Be aware of opportunities to uplift others. Opportunities are all around us. We are surrounded by people who need our love extended in many varying ways. We are surrounded in our communities by those who are in need of food and clothing and comfort. We can become aware of someone who needs a word of encouragement, a moment of our time. Sometimes it's just a smile. Sometimes our call is apparent, but sometimes we need to look for ways to help. We can pray for the Lord to show us where we can share his love. I've recently been called to take Holy Communion to someone who is unable to leave her home. There is an incredible sense of peace and humility in that experience with the Lord and my new friend. In bringing peace, I experience peace. The foundation of being a peacemaker is to be at peace ourselves. In Romans 5.1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Having that personal foundation, we are asked to share it, to pursue peace with those around us. We are to work at it diligently. We reflect the love of the Lord as we pursue peace with those around us. Kate Bowler is an associate professor of the history of Christianity at Duke University, Duke, Div, excuse me, Duke Divinity School. She's written a devotional that has a chapter called Small Things, Great Love. One story in this chapter tells of her piano teacher, who was also the church pianist. She was extremely faithful in her job even with a small congregation that didn't really have the best musical quality. One day, Adeline's husband of 56 years passed away. The next Sunday, they expected, the church expected, to try to make it through without their faithful accompanist. But there she was, Adeline at the piano. When asked what she was doing there, she just simply said, I was on the calendar, a small act of great love. She also tells about a saint named Therese, born in 1873 to a middle-class family in France. Her mom died when she was only four, and when she was a teenager, she decided she wanted to become a nun and joined an order of contemplative nuns living sheltered from the world. Unfortunately, Therese contracted tuberculosis at age 24, but when she learned that she, was, she would die, she decided that her ordinary life would be lived with limitless love. She called it the little way. She knew that great deeds were forbidden her, so the way she showed her love was by scattering flowers. When someone in her community would behave in a way that was ungracious or even petty and mean, Therese would double down and respond with even greater love and graciousness. We reflect the love of the Lord as we do small things with great love. We are each called by the Lord to listen to his word, to honor and respect and submit to each other in love, in Christ's love. We learn of his love and way by studying what he taught. We are called by many of the writers of scripture to put Christ's love into action in all of our relationships in big ways and in small. So I'd like to end with one of Kate Bowler's prayers of blessing. Dear God, 
Bless me with a radical love, inventor of love. And may that love overflow onto, into, and through me. Flood me with your kindness, generosity, and compassion, so that I may be your hands and feet in the world. God, bless me to be able to do small things with great love, one small action at a time, until it's a bridge with a span that reaches from my little life to yours with each act of love. Loving and loving again, being changed by your love and transforming the world, one little act of love at a time. Amen. So have a good week.